We are proud members of the Spy Podcast Network. Find out more at www.spypodcasts.com. Due to the themes of this podcast, listener discretion is advised. The key to all of these social media platforms is engagement, right? They're trying to get you to spend as much time as possible on their platform. You know, the amount of engagement that they get affects the amount that they can monetize their advertising. And and so they, they're really trying to get people to spend lots and lots of time to go from one post to the other. And one of the things that drives engagement is controversy. It's always been that way. And so they have these recommendation algorithms, and and, and Twitter is just a, a newsfeed algorithm that take you to extremist content because that's the that's what's juicing up controversy. This is particularly the case, you know, on YouTube, uh, and it's been that way for a long time. We know that Dylan Roof the the killer in, in South Carolina at the church in South Carolina who his whole arc of radicalization came from following going down the YouTube rabbit hole. Lock your doors. Close the blinds. Change your passwords. This is Secrets and Spies. Secrets and Spies is a podcast that dives into the world of espionage, terrorism, geopolitics, and intrigue. This podcast is produced and hosted by Chris Carr. On today's podcast, I'm joined by author and journalist David Nywer. David is an expert on the far right. He's written a fantastic book called Alt America. And on this episode, we take a look at the midterm elections. We have a look at online misinformation. And we also have a chat about the consequences or potential consequences of Elon Musk buying Twitter. It's quite a loaded episode, so get your favorite drink, sit back and relax. And I hope you find it informative. Thank you for listening and take care. Just before we begin, we now have a YouTube channel. I've been threatening it for a while and now we have it. So please follow the link below in the show notes and subscribe to our YouTube channel. On there are video versions of the podcast. So if you like to see a squiggly line with your interviews, you can now see a squiggly line on YouTube. If you wish to support the podcast, there are a few options for you. You can become a Patreon subscriber and directly support the show for three pounds a month. We also have a merchandise store at Redbubble. We have cups, coasters, water bottles, and tote bags all available on the Redbubble store. Also, if you enjoy this episode, please share it on social media among friends, family, colleagues, cohorts. And lastly, please leave a review on your podcast app. All reviews help the show get discovered by other people. Apple Podcasts in particular love reviews, and they really help this show get featured on the app. So please do leave a review. All the links are available in the show notes below. Thank you so much for your support. And without further ado, let's get going. The opinions expressed by guests on Secrets and Spies do not necessarily represent those of the producers and sponsors of this podcast. David, welcome back to the podcast. Thanks for having me, Chris. It's good to have you back on. Just for the benefit of new listeners, please can you just tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, so I'm a veteran journalist. I, I'm actually near retirement, should be near retirement, but I have to keep working because uh, my, my beat for the last 30 years has been right-wing extremism. Uh, I came, started out as a newspaper reporter and editor at uh, daily newspapers in the Pacific Northwest. And I, I worked for MSNBC in its origins uh, in their uh, web newsroom and uh, then became a stay-at-home dad. <laughs> <laughs> and um, at the end of which I started, you know, basically mostly freelancing mm-hmm. and uh, writing for the Southern Poverty Law Center, which I did for six years. And a few years ago, Daily Coast hired me away to be a senior staff writer for them. 
So that's what I do, and I specialize in writing about uh, raving extremists. I've published uh, well, well, well the, in July, my 10th book will be coming out on the subject, um, though they're not, they actually weren't all uh, books about the radical right, but I did have an orca book thrown in there. <laughs> <laughs> I live out in, uh, in a, on an island in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, where we have killer whales come visit yeah. pretty regularly. So I have a really uh, crazy Cassandra complex because I, I mean, I published a book in 2009 and then a second one in 2011 talking about the radicalization of the Republican Party and how it was happening um, mm -hmm. and uh, how and why it was happening. And, you know, I've been dismissed as an alarmist for years. And the thesis of these books was that what I was seeing was that this steady trafficking, steady movement of uh, what had been for uh, rhetoric and ideas and agendas moving from the uh, moving from the fringes into the mainstream of the Republican Party, particularly. Um, you know, the eliminationist rhetoric, uh, the rhetoric that basically argues that, uh, or basically, you know, it's demonizing rhetoric, dehumanizing rhetoric that uh, creates a, you know, a mindset where other people are seen as uh, objects fit only for elimination, uh, vermin, diseases, that sort of thing. And this has always been a hallmark of, fascism. And I was arguing, you know, the, the, ultimately the undercurrents that we're talking about here are fascism in a sort of new American form, neo-fascism. And, you know, and I was dismissed as an alarmist back then, but, yeah. you know, I, I was just reporting what I was seeing. I'm, a, I'm mm. an mm. old-fashioned news reporter, and I was just looking at what I was covering objectively and saying, this stuff is moving into the mainstream at an incredible rate. And it has, it's going to have a really toxic effect, particularly the conspiracism. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of the, the sort of wedging and uh, removal of people, you know, with the way they wedge people away from reality. Uh, they, they fall and they create an epistemological gap that um, is hard to overcome, you know. And so now we're, we really are awash and in a, an environment, an information environment, where people can't tell fact from fiction, you know, where Elon Musk can retweet a, a story from a fake mm. news site about Paul Pelosi's attacker actually being his secret gay lover, you know. I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is what this is what Musk did, mm. and you know, he's he's now <laughs> the owner of the largest social media platform out there yeah it does not um, bode well it does not bode does not well. bode well yeah no the information space is really under attack and ultimately in a lot of regards i think this is uh, is oligarchs who you know including those in russia but all around the world you know peter people like peter Thiel, who are openly hostile to democracy and mm. want to see it replaced with an autocratic form of authoritarianism. Let's call it a plutocratic autocracy, which is what I think they want to create. Uh, and that's pretty clear from listening to and watching people like Thiel, but also watching people like Vladimir Putin and his, and his oligarchs. They all uh, work, work the same way. And I think Elon Musk is, is clearly in that category now. Mm. I think a lot of tech people are actually. Yeah, yeah. yeah well, they they've learned that uh, getting their way and uh, having the ability to build an autocracy like that really depends on uh, creating so much chaos and disinformation. You know, dis chaos and I don't know what you would call it. Uh, it it's hell in the information space. Mm. Uh, it's creating so much chaos in the information space that people can't tell the truth from fiction and, and or in reality from unreality. And um, that's that along with fear mongering 
is one of the main ways to sort of um, inst- incite a, a psychological authoritarian response in the general population. I mean, authoritarianism's always latent in our personalities. I think it's a human trait. You know, it's always been in American society, I would mm. say between 15 and 20% of the population always had authoritarian personalities. Uh, but I think uh, since, since the early 2000s, uh, it has uh, increased dramatically. And I think now we're looking at 35 to 40% of the population, they're all Republican. I mean, there is left-wing authoritarianism. I wouldn't want to doubt that, but that's not what's happening here. Anyway, my background. (laughs) (laughs) Well, thank you very much for that very detailed picture. Well, as we're talking a little bit about Elon Musk, let's go straight into that. Um, So obviously he recently completed the purchase of Twitter, which led to significant concern about how the platform will tackle online abuse and misinformation, which to be fair, it hasn't done a particularly great job of. So you've talked to us a little bit about your thoughts on Elon Musk, uh, well, on on his purchase of Twitter. I don't know if there's anything else you sort of want to add to that. But one thing that I'm interested by is a lot of people seem to get stuck on what is and is not free speech and what is hate speech. And I was wondering maybe if we could clarify the difference between free speech and hate sure. speech, because uh, I think that would be quite useful for some people because we seem to keep getting stuck in this silly debate online. Yeah. Um, well, uh, free speech is, it, it depends on how, how enlightened, <laughs> how deep your views go on it. To mm-hmm. a lot of people, free speech just means I can say any freaking thing I want, right? And not have to suffer consequences. Mm-hmm. But the reality of the system of free speech that we uh, in, in the real world that we have is that, mm. yeah, you can say those things, but there are consequences for your speech, including public disapprobation, possibly loss of your employment. Uh, it just depends on what you say. And that's always been the case. Um, but um, today's sort of libertarian mindset seems to think that, no, no, we should have speech without consequences. And, and we do. Secondarily, free, untrammeled speech is not actually how we understand a, a robust system of free speech, which actually protects a, a, a more robust system, mm. does exclude uh, threatening and intimidating and hateful speech. Um, and, you know, it doesn't always do it through a system of laws. Um, sometimes it's just through how we've set up our system. For instance, in the United States, it's true that most hate speech is not, is, does not fall under, you know, is actually First Amendment protected speech, unless it is threatening or intimidating or threatens violence or is likely to inspire violence It's a, if it's incitement. Uh, so, but those are already the limitate, and those are the known limitations on free speech under the First Amendment, um, and always have been. However, for someone like Musk, um, who's dealing with a platform that operates internationally, those speech laws are very, very different in places like Germany and the UK. Mm -hmm. You don't uh, have the ability to just throw these things off. Secondly, uh, one of the key restraints on on hateful speech and, and false speech has always been our system of libel laws because you do you do face a, a lot of legal liability for saying false things about people, uh, and you can be taken to court. And if you have caused those people damage, uh, as Alex Jones found out, you can lose your entire business. Mm. <laughs> you know, I mean, he's he's now facing a billion dollar judgment. Right, yeah. and that's yeah. and that's always been uh, the the restraint that we've had, and and, and which is part of actually keeping a system of free speech robust. And of course, a couple of things have happened to that. In the age of the internet, it's extremely difficult to hold people accountable under the court system, particularly if they're big billionaires like Elon Musk or. Or Alex Jones. Well, Jones is a billionaire, he's a millionaire, but still, uh, he's always been able to, you know, just blow off libel lawsuits up until 
he, up until the Sandy Hook case. Um, so he had very few restraints on the extent to which he could smear and, and libel people. Um, and of course, I take this all very seriously because I was a newspaper editor for many years. And my job was to make sure that one of my jobs was to make sure the paper didn't get sued because I was in charge of of uh, maintaining our, our standards, uh, our legal standards. Uh, and those legal standards are really decayed, and uh, particularly in social media environment. But um, that said, you know, uh, you know, it, it ultimately, I, I think that, uh, you know, the, quote, this, the aim should be more open speech than free speech, mm. because in a system of open speech, people, particularly minorities, um, and people who are feel threatened by hate speech and that sort of thing, um, are uh, you know they're they're not able to participate. That's why you know, just as hate crimes, you know, hate crimes are very actually very effective because they're they're message crimes that tell people you're not welcome here, and they in fact do drive people away from uh, localities where they occur. We know this. This has always been the case. They're actually, unfortunately, very effective. Well, hate speech does the same thing. It's also very effective in driving people out of the discourse and driving people away from the public square. And so an ideal system of open speech um, provides protections for those people from the threats and intimidation. And it, it shouldn't be that hard because... Uh, you know, hate speech is actually very identifiable. I noticed that Tucker Carlson went on uh, the other day, I think yesterday, on his program and said, well, there's no such thing as hate speech. Actually, it's, there is, and it's, it's very readily identifiable. Hate speech, just like, you know, when I worked at the Southern Poverty Law Center, our explanation of what constitutes a hate group is that it's, um, that it is, uh, these are groups that whose entire reason for being is to demonize and smear with false uh, minor vulnerable minority groups with false information and to encourage violence against them, uh, probably often in the process of doing so. Uh, you know, maybe not overtly, but certainly a lot of hate groups do do mm -hmm. it overtly. But, you know, uh, what you're... What, the SPLC has always designated hate group is group, you know, that they're dedicated to the demonization of entire groups based on their um, innate characteristics. And that's what hate speech is too. It's, it's speech uh, directed at, uh, you know, encouraging the, the you know, de basically demonizing and dehumanizing the same vulnerable groups. And it's not that hard of a concept, you know? <laughs> That's, you know, it's, it's basically, yeah, it's the demonization and organizing, uh, dehumanizing events, uh, you know, like we've seen with the, uh, the people coming out to uh, attack the LGBTQ community mm. uh, in, the, in the past summer. Just left, you know, you know, going to drag queen story hours and and you know, proud boys turning out to threaten and intimidate people. Mm -hmm. And that's what hate speech is. And so it's I mean, it shouldn't be that hard to understand. No, but there's been a no. lot of there's been a lot of mud thrown in the water. A lot of people don't really understand. And particularly from right wing demagogues who don't want to have to deal with realities of what they're doing mm. is wielding hate speech like a sledgehammer mm. yeah you know? yeah yeah and are they trying to is it this expression about the changing the overton window or are these groups pushing kind of uh, are they trying to mainstream certain hateful ideas then and, and obviously twitter allows them sort of to do this if they aren't kind of keeping on top of it well i i think it's all part of a sustained attack on democracy i think mm. that you know, um, the one of the 
main fundamental attributes of a healthy democracy is that it protects the rights of its vulnerable minorities. And um, these people, these are people who are pretty explicit about wanting to attack vulnerable minorities. I mean, they specialize a lot of them in in anti-Semitic sentiment. And this is why the whole thing with Kanye West mm-hmm. yay, uh, has been, um, has roiled the waters on this side of the Atlantic so much. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And why, why then is it people like Elon Musk seem to be unable to distinguish between hate speech and free speech? Because it, it, it's, it just sort of strikes me as a bit weird. But Well, they're typically libertarians. Mm. They, they have a very simplistic view of what mm. constitutes free speech. And they don't understand that free speech is actually a very complicated business. Um, and that maintaining a robust system of free speech is, is a delicate balancing act. You know, at what point, where is your cutoff point for deciding mm. what's fascist and what's not? It's not, not, there's a lot of gray there. It's not easy. And it, it comes down to the old, should the tolerant people, a system of tolerance, tolerate intolerance? Should, should you allow people who are intolerant into your system of, system of intolerance. Yeah. Yeah. And what I've always tried to explain to people is that, that that's, that it's not simply a matter of being able to absorb the intolerance. It's the fact that tolerance and intolerance are like matter and antimatter. They can't mm, exist mm. in the same place. Um, when one will destroy the other, I mean, typically the intolerance will destroy the toler- the system of tolerance. So you have to find a way to exclude uh, intolerance from your system of tolerance, mm. but it's it's a tricky balancing act. You have to know, you have to to understand the sort of fine lines that get drawn, especially nowadays. With you know, I mean, you have this whole alt right ecosystem out there. People are very web savvy. And who um, know how to evade? Uh, are, they're very good at evading um, social media's attempts to cut down on their spreading of, of their their hateful speech and hateful ideas. Um, and you know, it's it's not a. It, it, I wouldn't want to be in. Anybody's shoes at Twitter. Let's put it that way. Because, <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> um, it's yeah. like, no, because you can't win for losing. And, and yeah, they do a crappy job. And it's pretty amazing to me. I've seen people get suspended for stuff that was clearly not hateful. Well, didn't you have a issue with that with one of your book covers because it had a um it was making a point about a nazi symbol if i remember correctly and and some the algorithm. Ku Klux Klan. that's it i, had, Ku Klux Klan, Ku Klux, yeah. I had a clan hoods on the cover yeah. of my book alt america and i used a strip of it and they <laughs> yeah, they suspended me for three weeks um and we talked through it i, I was not satisfied with the outcome of that mm. mostly but you know i i, I felt i had uh, discussions with people inside Twitter where mm. we felt that I understood that they were, you know, working to make the system better. Yeah. Um, but I'm still appalled by how, I mean, actually YouTube is much worse. It's, it's mm. amazing to mm. me how um, I, I've had a number of my videos, which uh, I put up uh, mostly either at, at uh, SPLC or at daily coast. Um, who, you know, because these right mean extremists go out and do these reporting attacks mm. on my work and the work of any journalist who's who's taking these guys on. And, you know, they'll, and what I'm doing, of course, is documenting their hate speech and doc, uh, putting it up on video. And the originals that are, that I'm taking them from will remain up on YouTube, but they'll uh, they'll do these reporting campaigns to get mine removed. I had a number of excellent uh, videos showing Alex Jones being completely completely bonkers, 
And, you know, it was contextualized. It took you to a link to explain yeah. that this, yeah. what people were seeing. But, mm. uh, but YouTube, YouTube wound up, you know, taking them down, giving me strikes. Um, mm. So I don't do a lot of <laughs> video posting on YouTube now. Just to, to clarify, so you were sort of saying that YouTube and, and Twitter are quite slow at actually tackling the original kind of hateful content that you were investigating, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, <laughs> they'll leave stuff up. I mean, there's a there's yeah. a bunch of hate mongers out there, and yeah. on Twitter too. I mean, there's let's put it this way: probably the most obnoxious white nationalist figure operating in the media sphere right now is a guy mm. named Jack Posobiec, uh, and he's he's just got this long deep background of of hobnobbing and dealing with and uh, white nationalists and and promoting their rhetoric and agendas. Yeah, yeah. But the guy is still, uh, I mean, he's got a million followers and he's or they're on Twitter. And so they won't, they don't take him down. Um, I'm not sure what, why, um, but, you know, it took him a long time to take down David Duke too. Mm, mm, mm. And well, is it these social media companies are sort of making money out of the traction from some of this content? The key to all of these social media platforms is engagement, right? They're trying to get you to spend as much time as possible on their platform. You know, the amount of engagement that they get affects the amount that they can monetize their advertising. And, and so they, they're really trying to get people to spend lots and lots of time to go from one post to the other. And one of the things that drives engagement is controversy. It's always been that way. And so they have these recommendation algorithms, and, and, and Twitter is just a, a newsfeed algorithm that take you to extremist content because that's the that's what's juicing up controversy. This is particularly the case, you know, on YouTube. Uh, and it's been that way for a long time. We know that Dylan Roof, the, the killer in, in South Carolina, at the church in South Carolina, who his whole art of radicalization came from following, going down the YouTube rabbit hole. And I've talked to mm. a number of people who are extremists who, you know, got their start on YouTube and it's because of their algorithms, but it's not just YouTube. It's all these algorithms that drive people to, you know, eventually it takes you right to extremist content in almost no time at all, uh, because it's all about driving engagement. And they've found that these, you know, these extremist videos and extremist content mm. will drive engagement because it's controversial. Mm. Does it not leave the social media companies kind of legally liable from a kind of duty of care point of view? So you've, you've spoken to people who have been radicalized via via YouTube, and obviously if that could be proved in a court of law, does that not threaten the existence of YouTube in the near future? Oh, well, I think there's washing so much money that... <laughs> Yeah, it's got probably, all the lawyers. Yeah. <laughs> they they can probably you know make those kinds of lawsuits go away pretty easily, mm. and it, there are, especially in the United States, there are laws written in that that actually protect uh, these providers. You know, they got passed, of course, at the uh, great huzzas from <laughs> Silicon Valley, but but yeah, they, they have we have laws in place that. Pro protect these providers from any kind of liability so that's you know they could obviously face liability over in europe but mm -hmm. depends on what your laws are but certainly yeah they get away with a lot in the u.s because they've written it into law that they can get away with a lot you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah 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 well interesting i'll just segue into alex jones because obviously the individuals who still can be liable for pumping out nonsense basically or misinformation and alex jones obviously recently as we mentioned earlier he he got slapped with a potential bill of 960 million dollars in compensation for his misinformation and sort of downright lies about the sandy hook victims what are your thoughts on that ruling against alex jones and do you think it might make a positive difference it might make people think twice before sharing kind of or, or spreading kind of nonsense online well i would certainly think so i think a lot of people are realizing that there's severe liabilities involved with this i mean that was why jones got the platform from youtube and places like that because 
uh, those companies did not want to have to be associated with the liabilities that were going to be coming down the pike with what this guy was doing. Um, and, you know, I mean, Sandy Hook was in 2012. He did it for a long time. And he made these people's lives hell. And, you know, uh, I, I thought, yeah, I mean, you, you hate to put a dollar amount on the kind of suffering that he inflicted on them. But, yeah. A billion dollars sounds good to me. <laughs> you know, that's yeah. I mean, what he yeah. did yeah. was, in my mind, so foul and disgusting. I mean, it's just the opposite of what I've always thought. You know, your ethos should be if you're operating in the media space, which is, you know, I think your first rule should be to do no harm. And um, because you know, you have tremendous power, a great amount of ability to harm people in the information space, particularly by spreading lies about them, and particularly by, you know, and I can't think of anything worse than making life hell for a grieving parent. It's just, um, I just, I still, it still boggles my mind what he did there. But he's, you know, that's not the only case where Jones did that, and it's he's not the only one who's done stuff like this, mm. you know. We have lots of examples of conspiracy theorists making life hell for all kinds of people. Just think of what happened to health workers during the COVID pandemic. Uh, we had health workers here in the United States who were being physically assaulted, threatened at their homes, followed to their cars. Um, you know, oh, just horrific behavior. Uh, and all because they were just doctors. And now we have doctors who provide transgender care to young people in need facing similar kinds of just horrific threats, all based on these bizarre conspiracy theories and, and not just bizarre conspiracy theories, but also really sort of hateful worldviews that sees transgender people as a threat. Mm. So. Mm. Mm. Yeah, we'll talk about the sort of real world consequences of sort of online rhetoric. So just last Friday, the 28th of November, an armed man broke into Nancy Pelosi's house. And Nancy Pelosi is the US House Speaker. And um, he was looking for her and she was actually out of town at the time on, on business. And her husband ended up in an altercation with a man named David DePape, I believe his name is, who's a 42-year-old man who's now been charged for this attack. But, I mean, it's shocking. It's, it's not the first case a politician has been attacked. Um, and I, I, I fear it won't be the last either. I don't know what your thoughts are on this case. There is a, a long string of... Uh incidents like this and de Pappy was a guy who uh, regurgitated and absorbed a lot of conspiracy theories particularly mm -hmm. the kind the dehumanizing kind uh, of conspiracy theories that you know I consider eliminationist which is to make people believe that other people are an existential threat to everybody else uh, and and of course this is something that it's not just conspiracy theorists who've seen all kinds of mainstream Republicans um, make Nancy Pelosi out to be an existential threat to the country. You can find plenty of examples of it on Fox News and uh, or go back through, you know, the Rush Limbaugh archives. And it's been going on a long time. So, I mean, look, I, I think that it's going to just be a matter of time after seeing all the the uh, fuck Biden flags and let's go Brandon flags and and uh, stuff like that, uh, people running around uh, uh, waving signs and flags here in the United States, pretty sure there's going to be some some attempts on on the president's life as well as the vice presidents as well. Uh, I imagine there, that it's possible there already have been and, and Secret Service has kind of kept it under wraps. Because you don't, you know, if they're able to catch them preemptively. Levels of sheer venom and hatred that are being ginned up on, on the Republican right now are frightening and disturbing and make me want to move to New Zealand. <laughs> <laughs> 
Actually, I love New Zealand. I, yeah, I yeah. I'm yet to go. I'm hoping to go in the next couple of years, yeah. but uh, I hear it's a lovely place to be, actually. But um, yeah. I, when you said that, I was just thinking of Douglas Copeland's Generation X as a chapter called New Zealand Gets Nukes too. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, oh, I know, I know. But at least it's the last place, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, indeed. That's where, this is what, isn't that where On the Beach happens? Did you ever read oh, yes, book? yes, yes. Yeah, <laughs> Neville Duke. Yeah, my dad used to talk about that book often because <laughs> it was the last place. Yeah, yeah. Just for listeners who haven't seen it, it or read it, it's um, is it the world? There's been a nuclear apocalypse, and a, and there's a, a a small group of people left in New Zealand, and the cloud of radiation is slowly coming towards them. Is that right? Correct. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and yeah, and in the end they die too, right? But. But uh, but at least it's the last place. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, you know, the most my biggest concern is that that I think the fabric of democracy has become incredibly thin in this country, and yeah. I don't know how it feels over there, but it, that's how it feels here. Yeah, we've had our second unelected prime minister. <laughs> So it's like democracy is not exactly succeeding in Britain at the moment either. <laughs> yeah, what, what are they going to have hold an election over there? <laughs> well, they've got to do it legally in two years, two and a bit year, two and a half years. Um, so whether because I, I don't see the Conservative Party wanting an early election because it won't fall in their favour. But if they can kind right. of sort themselves out and have some stability, they might just sort of pull it off again for another election they only call an early election when they think they can win it i think right, um, right. so we'll see what happens is it's tricky because we had um with the opposition the labor party which i suppose is the british equivalent of the democratic party there's still kind of internal debate about the philosophy of the party since they you know they've lost successive elections um and um and that and then we've had brexit and um and an interesting thing with Brex, the Brexit vote, it actually a lot of people who were previously pro Labour, so like some of the the miners from the miners' strike in the nineteen seventies and early eighties who were against Thatcher, actually voted for the Conservative Party because the Conservative Party were going to guarantee Brexit. Um, so Brexitism is pretty much in my mind, quite similar to Trumpism, where people, there seems to be some sort of kind of cognitive dissonance a little bit with it, where people become irrational over this topic, uh, even if it's sort of not turning into a positive, they just seem to want to keep Brexit going. And at the moment, Brexit doesn't look like it's doing well. Um, we've had, obviously, the effects of COVID and things. Now those are sort of subsided. It's now starting to look more and more like Brexit's the ultimate kind of villain of the country's ills. Um, yeah. And yet there are people out there, if, if it becomes a political point again, which for some people on the left want it to, I mean, personally, I'd love us to rejoin the EU, but I don't see it as a winning strategy for the Labour Party in the next election. Uh, but there are some people who want to make it a talking point, and I think that will lose Labour the next election if they do. So that's kind of where we're at with it, um, I, in my my sort of view of things and, and what I've observed. But it's pretty... Uh, yeah, there's still no guarantee that Labour will win the next election if it all implodes, uh, and I think it's Brexit's the main reason for that. So weird. <laughs> <laughs> it is, it's pretty, it is. pretty obvious <laughs> from this side of the pond that, you know, Brexit has just completely trashed the British economy. And, yeah. and it comes down to this sort of authoritarianism. Mm. People believed a lot of false information, this disinformation mm. Mm. that revolved around the Brexit campaign. Yeah. And, and the thing is, the thing about it is once you buy in, it's really hard to get out. A lot of these people who buy into this authoritarian world, you, they defend it stoutly, partly because mm. they understand, I think, at a basic level, that it's that it is irrational and factual and based on bullshit. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a social connection to it as well, isn't there? Because right. you get these kind of communities of people, like in certain physical places, Brexit, yeah. like in London, where I am now in London, London is pretty anti-Brexit. So, so being in London is quite easy with being, you know, wanting to be back in the EU. Is uh, But if I were in a very small town up north where they were very anti the EU, um, it might be very hard to be, um, uh, you know, to want to go back in the EU or want to stay in the EU. Um, and, and I know, like, uh, I've got a, a friend whose mother um, lives in Florida 
and she is secretly a Democrat because, God forbid, she mentioned anything negative about the Republicans in the little town where she lives because she would be excommunicated from her friends, her neighbours, and certain members of her family. And that's yeah. quite my sad. Mom, but my, fa- my family's in Idaho, and trust me, that's exactly how it is out there. And, and I think that's kind of what then leads to it going on longer than it should do because yeah. I think in time – it would be a generational thing, I think, but I think maybe in 10 or 15 years' time might be the time to consider reversing Brexit because by then I think the country will be kind of ready to consider it was a bad idea. But obviously I'm just speculating now. It's not based on any research. <laughs> but um, but it just feels like that irrationality just keeps it going. And actually, in fact, one example of that irrationality, if I may, um, when after a year after Brexit, and I think it was the anniversary, the BBC were interviewing certain people who had voted for it. And there was this gentleman who um, had an eel farm that had been in the family for, I think, 100 years. So this business had been around for 100 years. And, and then right. it, it, the, basically the business fell apart because since leaving the EU, what you have to do now is you'd have to provide a health certificate per eel. So right. you can see how expensive that gets. If you're selling hundreds or thousands of eels a week, <laughs> to get a health certificate for every one of them must be quite complicated. Uh, and obviously being part of the EU, we bypassed all that, but now no. And so his business ended, and his yeah. he and his family for about 100 years, if I remember correctly, and the BBC journalist asked him, would you still vote for Brexit? And the guy said, yes, I would. Yeah, so yeah. It, it, that, he just literally he destroyed his way of life. Yeah, yeah, I, I remember that interview. <laughs> it's, it's like the jo- the 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 online meme about uh, yeah. Who would have thought that the leopard e- face eating party would eat my face? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. So it's there is a degree of irrationality with some of this that I I don't know, and uh, as we've been saying with the online information space, I don't see how. Um, we can easily get past it. I think in time you can with better education. Because I again I've met people who I've got friends who've got like um I've got friends who've got like MAs and 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 uh, very first class degrees. And some of them have spread nonsense online because they seem to be able to in academia source things properly but in their day-to-day life they seem to almost forget that you still need to use those skills when it comes to sharing information on the internet and like with the elon musk thing earlier um i can't even remember the name of the website he'd shared this information from but it wasn't a mainstream website it was some random website that he was sharing this nonsense from and he would have thought a man with some intelligence because elon musk is not stupid would think about the sourcing of the information he's sharing but he didn't and people don't and it's really weird Right. Well, I, I think the first step has to be shutting off the spigots of disinformation. Mm. You know, the conspiracy theorists and 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 trying to find a way to, you know, slow down that flow of bullshit. I, it's just a it's just a deluge of bullshit that we've been having to deal with, and that would include having to do something about Fox News. I mean, yeah. I, I'm not against Fox News being in business. I just want them to join. The business of journalism, yeah, because what they're, what they're doing now is is just blatantly propaganda, Republican yeah. propaganda, yeah. And it's not yeah. they don't even try to hide it anymore. They used to back in the nineties, you know, sort of semi disguise it and oh, or we're not partisan, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> We have Alan Combs on with uh, Sean Hannity. <laughs> yeah, or, or Glenn Greenwald's popular on there now, isn't he? <laughs> isn't he representing the left now, quote, quote? <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's popping up. But, uh, yeah, I, I don't know anyone who actually takes seriously the idea that Glenn is of the left anymore. But, yeah. Ah, he's a funny one, that guy. But, <laughs> but there we go, warning. Oh, he's an, oppor- he's an opportunist. So. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I um, think so. We we briefly talked about Yi, who was formerly known as Kanye West earlier, um, where he tweeted out he was going to go DEFCON 3 on Jewish people. Um, and, you know, this obviously has sort of sort of given a green light for bigots online to share their views. What, what do you think about this particular episode? Because it seemed quite... Um, I don't know, to me it seemed there was a lot of people who didn't quite understand what was going on, and some people have supported Kanye when they would really probably shouldn't. Well, Kanye's uh, diatribes, his anti-Semitic diatribes, were, if you know the world of right-wing extremism well, mm, mm. you immediately identified the stuff he was spouting as coming from this racist sect 
called Black Hebrew Israelism, uh, which is essentially a counterpart, uh, the Black counterpart to a movement that I intimately familiar with called Christian Identity, mm. uh, which uh, descended from the old British Israelism sect. You know, people who believed that the that white people were the true children of Israel, and that Jews are literally the descendants of Satan, and that non-white people are soulless mud people. That's what they call them. Uh, that's that's Christian identity. Uh, Black Hebrew Israel is, is sort of a, a, a converse take mm. on Christian identity. They take the ideas of Israelism and give them basically to black people that black people are the true children of Israel. And, um, and they're both reliant on the same cons uh, anti-Semitic conspiracy theories at their base, which is that, you know, these satanic Jews um, are secretly manipulating the rest of the world. Uh, and, you know, it's closely related to, pro I mean, they all tout, Protocols of Seven Elders of Zion, and all of the very hoary anti-Semitic conspiracy theories that have been around for a hundred years. And that's certainly what Kanye was doing. Um, in a lot of his diatribes, I, I listened to them and was able to you know, figure out what he was doing and saying. But of course, this just was just a huge green light for all these racist neo Nazis over here, and, and probably probably in the UK as well. Oh, I'm, I, yeah, I, I must. I didn't monitor, but I'm sure I would have thought definitely. <laughs> but, but yeah, like Nick Fuentes, the mm. the white nationalist who runs the America First Pack. Mm. Mm. Uh, uh, Nick is a real. He's just a flagrant anti-Semite racist. He's been kicked off at of Twitter and, and and tried to come back this week because of Elon, by the way. Uh, but but Nick is, uh, you know, he was just positively exultant over Kanye's remarks and was, yes, he's the man. And he started playing Kanye West songs on his podcast and stuff like oh, that. Goodness. Yeah, um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, it, but it wasn't just Kanye, of course. It was, it's like it was almost like what Kanye did was like uh, it just it set this tone where, well, if he can say it, a lot of people can. So then we had you know Laura Logan doing this interview on Newsmax, where she started talking about you know how these globalists are drinking the blood of children, mm. you know, which is yeah. the sealed blood libel stuff. Yeah, yeah, dates back yeah. to the 12th century. And has created a sort of ominous tone here, especially as you know we are going down into the election, and I don't know. You know, anytime anti-Semitism rears its ugly head, it's worrisome because my experience has been that that it's sort of the er conspiracy theory mm -hmm. that. Uh, most conspiracism is kind of a pipe or is a, it, it operates on the same mentality and many of them uh, are outgrowths of anti-Semitic conspiracy theories. And often people, if you, you know, conspiracy theorists, if you talk to them long enough, they do get around to the, the anti-Semitic mm. components too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, definitely. And, What's interesting of anti-Semitism, it also seems to be one of these horrible things that kind of comes from many political spectrums, because it, it comes from the far left, it comes from the far right. Because yeah. um, in the UK, many, uh, gosh, I've lost track now when we were, 2017, 2018, I think it was, no, 2019, sorry, um, the then leader of the Labour Party, Jeremy Corbyn, was caught up in a huge anti-Semitism scandal because he wasn't handling it at all well. And at the same time, he seems to be quite sympathetic with um, certain Palestinian uh, groups. And some of those groups would openly share very anti-Semitic views. And Jeremy Corbyn right. didn't really have the, I don't know, the savvy or, or the will to challenge that. 
um, and that led to his sort of defeat. Uh, but there are still people out there who who want him back as lead, leader of the Labour Party. It's yeah, it's an interesting one, anti-Semitism, because it just seems to be it seems to be one of these things with socialists and you know and and sort of very far left socialists, sorry, um, and far right people seem to kind of mm-hmm. almost be having a barbecue and and enjoying themselves yeah. suddenly, you know, <laughs> finding common ground. Yeah. Oh yeah, no, there there has been some uh, some convergence around anti-Semitism. Uh, yeah, uh, and historically, that's happened. Um, mm. There's always been, as you know, if you believe in horseshoe theory, which I don't necessarily, but it is the two ends of the horseshoe coming together, um, mm. and that is a, a real phenomenon. They call it, I think, uh, red brown, <laughs> the red brown phenomenon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and yeah, I, I, we're seeing a lot of that uh, around the Ukraine war too. Mm. Uh, we're seeing a lot of people uh, on the left uh, adopting Putin's uh, propaganda and pushing Putin's propaganda, and which you know there's and there's just profoundly anti-Semitic undercurrents in mm-hmm. everything mm-hmm. Putin is, mm-hmm. is doing these days. Yeah, yeah. Well, we haven't actually talked about this at all, but I mean, obviously, the war in Ukraine has that had an effect on on. Um, you know, sort of uh, right-wing extremism um, and far-left extremism, I suppose. Yeah, it's, well, no, it's been the meeting ground for a lot of the far-left and far-right that we've been seeing here when it's occurred here in the U.S. Um, and, you know, it's it, it, honestly, the COVID pandemic had a similar yeah. effect. We yeah. saw a lot of people who used to be really left uh, becoming completely radicalized during the COVID pandemic because they were anti-vaxxers, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, I mean, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. is one of the leading anti-vaxxers, and he's Robert F. Kennedy Jr., you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, no longer considered a progressive, but, uh, yeah. And, and, yeah, Kennedy's... All those guys who started trotting out the anti-Semitic or really played up sometimes the anti-Semitic components of mm, uh, mm. COVID denialism. And, yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, it's big. Well, um, we are coming up to the midterm elections uh, on the 8th of November. So, um, you know, and, and we've obviously seen many members of the Republican Party have still embraced Trump and his sort of MAGA philosophy, if you want to call it that. So what is at stake in the midterm elections? And I suppose also maybe for the case of a British audience, could you tell us a little bit about sort of how the midterm elections actually work as well? Well, the midterm elections are just uh, races for for the House and Senate, uh, as well as numerous uh, state-level offices, you know, governorships, attorney generals, secretary of state uh, positions. Yeah. Um, typically, in off election years, the incumbent president's party suffers defeat or suffers losses in the midterms. It's just something that happens in American politics. Uh, there's a sort of cooling off period and reaction that happens after someone wins an election. Mm. So the expectation has been for some time that how the Republicans are going to retake the House and may retake the Senate. I don't think the Senate's going to happen. I think the House is possible. Mm. But I, I have reason to believe that, that it's not going to happen this year, partly because I think the Roe v. Wade ruling really inspired mm-hmm. a huge amount of fresh registrations, particularly among young people um, out there, and particularly among women. And so I, I think a lot of the polling is skewed because I think it's missing a real surge of interest in people who are going to be, who are coming out, you know, they're not going out protesting, they're just going out and registering to vote and planning to mm-hmm. vote. And mm. they're planning to go democratic. So we'll see how that turns out. I don't know. Yeah. The biggest trend that we've been having to deal with here is just this wave of election denialism that's taken over the Republican Party. Um, I mean, something like uh, nearly half of the Republican co- candidates running, uh, 53%, I think, of, of the Republican candidates for uh, office. Our election denialists that you know they agree that they believe that 
there's massive election fraud going on. Of course, there's no evidence that that is. And moreover, that this, the 2020 election was stolen from Trump. You know, they have been spreading this um, conspiracy theory generated mm-hmm. by Dinesh D'Souza with his fake documentary, 2000 Mules. And they're, you know, they're going around and showing it to uh, Republican audiences and churches and things like this all over the place. And it's kind of a, a clever bit of propaganda if you don't know how elections work. <laughs> So it is very effective in convincing people that, oh, yeah, Democrats stole the election for Trump. And so now we have all of these people uh, from the right doing this volunteer poll watching, and they're going out and turning up with body armor and AR-15s outside of polling stations and taking people's uh, pictures of people's uh, license plates and their faces uh, when they drop their ballots off. And, you know, it's just it's just classic voter intimidation. Uh, but they're getting away with it. That's one of the things that's going on. But the biggest thing is that this election nihilism is now, you know, it's really embedded in the Republican Party. Something like 70% of the Republican Party agrees with it. Yeah. And I think it's priming them to violence uh, in the form of another insurrection. Because I think it's going to, con- especially if, you know, if and to an any Republican loses any of these races, there's going to be people claiming that it's fraud. And there's going to be angry, footloose, patriot warriors, as they call themselves, out there uh, ready to, to, you know, take their anger out on elected officials, police, mm. Um, mm. random citizens. Anyone who get, has the misfortune of getting in their way, bad timing, you know, whatever it's going to be, or... Be falling into their falling into their targets. So um, yeah, I think election. The, the biggest thing about election denialism is that it really undermines. I mean, the, having confidence in your elections is just a fundamental aspect of a healthy democracy. It's one of been you know certainly fundamental to the United States' ability to maintain its political stability for. 200 plus years and th- or 250 years, it is, I guess now. Yeah. yeah. And I don't know. I'm, I'm having a hard time um, understanding how we have a media system that doesn't recognize this for the existential threat to our system of democracy that it is. But, but it is. When you have this many people believing that the elections are going to be fraudulent no matter what, Unless, of course, a Republican wins. It's part of that war on democracy. And that's what I described in the book. And yeah, if, I mean, just think of it from Vladimir Putin's point of view. If you mm. wanted to if you wanted to undermine American the American system and render the country as weak as you possibly could, what would you do? You would undermine its democracy. How would you undermine its democracy? Convince half the country that its elections are illegitimate. And, you know, I don't I don't know if Putin's behind it, but that's certainly what has happened. Well, he's definitely benefiting from it. And he might, if, if the Republicans do do well, they want to pull funding um, of military support from Ukraine. Yeah, so then that could give, because this winter's the turning point, really. It's if, um, mm-hmm. And the same in the UK, too, because our defence spending's still under review with the new Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak. And, and um, so yeah. if, if America pulls its commitment, I suspect Britain will slow, will reduce its commitment, too. Um, and that does not bode well for the Ukrainians. So it's, there seems to be a lot riding on this, this election. Um, one one speculative question I'd love to, or big question, because as as a Brit just watching all this, how likely is Donald Trump? How likely is it he could return to the presidency? <laughs> That's is an interesting one. Though. Um, I, I I think it's incredibly unlikely that he could ever win the popular vote, which he's never done. Mm. I think it's entirely plausible that if things go sideways in this 2022 election and we get all these Trumpist secretary of states um, elected in, you know, election officials elected in states like Arizona and Nevada 
as they've been, they've been pouring millions of dollars into these races. I mean, I, I have a guy who, you know, covered elections for years, especially state elections and, you know, secretary of state's races, you know, maybe you'd, in today's context, maybe you'd spend a hundred thousand dollars on that race, right? They're spending millions on these secretary of state's races because they want to control those offices. So if they're successful, um, I would say things are going to be very fraught in 2024. Uh, I think that they they could actually attempt their own form of election fraud, which is, you know, put up these bogus slates of electors as, they, as Trump tried to get them to do in 2020. So I think that's entirely plausible. Uh, it's certainly if there's enough of them, uh, they can really play havoc with the uh, the you know, the system of elections we have in this country. Mm. So, If the Republicans are widely defeated... There will be violence. Yes, there will be violence. Do you think there will ever be a kind of long-term positive outcome? Um, or do you think it's we're in this situation now where there's very little movement either way now? I, I think um, I think it's possible that that it would provoke such an outburst of violence that eventually uh, uh, it was shaking enough people out of their, out of their bubble uh, that they've built around themselves. Um, but I, I, I hate to say it, but you know, in this country, we, we don't really act or, or make big change like that big fundamental change like that without something really bad happening. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. And obviously Think about all the endless school shootings. Still, very little's happened about gun control. Exactly, exactly. Um, I mean, Sandy Hook should have been the end of it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and I think Uvalde did a lot uh, to change people, but not. It's still we're still not there. Um, yeah, that's uh, and it's tragic, you know the. The gun violence has you know, gotten to the level where people are kind of accepting it almost uh, on a daily basis. And it's that's really disturbing. I'm glad my kids grown because um, I couldn't imagine trying to raise a child in an environment where they have to go to school worrying about whether there's some mass shooter is going to break in and kill them. Yeah, you yeah, know? and. On top of that, all the nonsense on the internet that so many children are exposed to now as well. Yeah. yeah. Yes. It must be very difficult uh, bringing anybody up now. But uh, but there we go. Well, before we part ways today, is there anything else that you would like to discuss that's important to you that we may have missed or, or anything we haven't covered today? No, I think kind of covered the basis of certainly what's been on my mind lately. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm, I'm very worried about the country. So worried about democracy and uh, I'm, I'm worried, you know, worried about journalism, my craft. Uh, mm. I think it's uh, become seriously degraded over the last 20 years. And uh, maybe because of corporate ownership of, of the media. And I don't know how we unwind all that either. So, mm. Mm. Yeah, that's no, not good. Well, David, thank you for your time. Where can listeners find out more about you and your work? Um, well, I'm very visible on Twitter. I have about 50,000 followers on Twitter. So check me out there at David Nywert. Um, and then you can read my work at dailycoast.com. That's ko dailycos.com. Um, and I write a post a day for them. Very long weekdays. <laughs> and um, try to keep people abreast on what's going on in the world of right-wing extremism. Uh, fortunately, I'm not the only person, not the only reporter uh, cover, uh, handling some of that beat uh, at the place. There's, we have some very good journalists there. Um, so, yeah, check that out. Uh, and then look for, uh, you can look for my uh, Alt America on the bookshelves and look forward to the age of insurrection next July. Thank you very much for your time today. Hey, thanks for having me on, Chris. Always a pleasure.
for listening. This is Secrets and Spies.